and one of a team of five curators. Um, and I've been curating for been going on seven years. Um, my tribes are from the top of the North Island, the upper part of the North Island, uh, but I've been down here in Wellington for quite a while working on Māori arts. Beside me, while well, she's just on the phone, is Stephanie Gibson, curator history from the history team. So we're split into disciplines here at the Papa. Hello, John. And uh, yeah. Stephanie, yeah. Uh, Stephanie and I are co writing a book on protest and resistance and material collections. And that's due to be published next year in August. So we're right in the early stages of assembling our material and our protest themes. Is that enough? Don't wait. Our IT guy's on his way to sort out our sound so it won't be so stilted. Excellent, and I'm Stephanie Gibson, History Curator at Te Papa. Kia ora, everybody. Here we go. Here's our IT person, Te Papa. Hi. Thank you. So, Megan here, they can't hear us. Megan can't hear us. We can't hear it. Okay, we can't hear it. I turned the sound up here. So does that mean you can hear us now? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want to start again or do you want to keep continuing? We can keep going. We can keep Great, going. okay. So as long as you know who we are. Um, we got your questions and we've, we're um, not quite sure how you want to do this. Would you want us to just talk about our work and the kind of protest collections we've been doing now or that we respond Pretty, uh, we respond directly to the questions that were sent to us because there's around about I think eight, seven or eight questions there. I think it'd be really helpful to have an overview of your work and then um, answer the questions as that works. Does that sound okay with people? Yeah. Getting lots of nods. And I will ask people in the room here if you have questions, could you please come up to the front to ask them because otherwise um, they won't see you? And for those online, if you can somehow wave or let us know that you have a question, that'd be great. Thanks. Oh, okay. Well, uh, in overview, uh, we collect. We've been collecting protests over the for over many years at Te Papa, and some of it's been well after fact, and some of it has been hot on the heels of uh, significant protests. And that every object we collect has been on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. and everything is very, uh, very uh, tightly scrutinized by at least two committees of people here at Te Papa. So there is a lot of rigor and analysis as we put forward our proposed collection items, mm -hmm. uh, and it's always a, it's always consensus, it's always a group decision, and there's always lots of support. So we're never alone. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's all very very well researched and thought out. And it's often based on good relationships with people in the community. So uh, often it's not that, it's not an isolated event. It will be through our connections and through people we've worked with over the years, with families of activists who have passed on. Um, they tend to be quite organic experiences, uh, these collecting projects. Uh, and it's been very rewarding. And we've not had, as far as I can tell, for why you can correct me, I've not encountered any major opposition or any issues, any political issues. I've not encountered interference of that type. Mm. Uh, we can get into more case studies a bit later. Mm. 
Um, while in protest, uh, it's probably a little bit different. With There are a number of different collecting institutions around the country, national collecting institutions, and in particular, the National Library and the Alexander Turnbull Library, which hold a lot of protest material and for Māori historical protests, usually in the form of petitions, you know, very um, gentrified style of protest from the 19th and early 20th century. But with regards to the confrontational style of um, protest that started emerging after the American um, civil rights uh, movement, in New Zealand we started seeing it happen around about the 70s and peaked around about the late 70s going into the early 80s. There is a lot of protest material um, scattered among different national institutions, usually in the form of photographs, letters, banners, flyers, those kinds of things. Te Papa will tend to collect um, not so much the documents but the material, um, material objects. But with protest, a protest, you may only see it on paper, like as in flyers and stuff like that. So we're increasingly starting to um, get that material if it is telling a really powerful story. So, um, I have had some some resistance to the kind of stuff I wanted to collect. Um, uh, I, an object in particular is a um, we have a, a more of an evangelical church here in New Zealand called Destiny Church. And uh, around about 2004, they held a protest march um, protesting against the Civil Unions Bill and a Prostitution Legalisation Act that was about to be carried through Parliament. And when I went to go and bring a lot of the Destiny Church material in, um, there was still not a huge opposition, but consternation that I was bringing that kind of material in because they're a very unpopular church. Uh, but I thought it was really important. Can you hear us again? Audio seems to have just dropped. Okay. Okay, but there you are. Okay. So yeah, so we're, we're going to go through. So at the moment, Stephanie and I are really focused on producing material for a book that we've been asked to write. Uh, Steph, her work goes much longer than mine. She's much more experienced curator and has been collecting the protest for a lot longer than I have. So she's got um, an amazing background and um, sort of swag of, of, of material that is already in Papa because of Steph. Um, so what we're trying to do is create this book that is a very, well, we, would, we think very personal selection of material of protests. Um, so it's not an encyclopedia of New Zealand protests, it's more uh, material culture that appears in private and public collections that we want to showcase and profile and talk about some of the material that comes from protests. Um, but as you can imagine, we still need to do a lot of collecting for it because there are a lot of protests that we want to talk about that aren't represented in, in the collection, in any collection. And for me, there are protests that have happened where the material is still only in private hands. Um, so I want to try and showcase it. So we're developing the book as well as developing um, acquisition um, steps to bring in more material. Uh, um, we'll go through your questions, if that's all right, and then if you've got any questions at the end, just let us know, we'll just wave a hand up at that empty microphone. So the first question is, how do they disseminate and provide access? Well, how do we disseminate and provide access to the material collected? Do we have examples? Yes, so uh, we have our collections online, which uh, I can send the link afterwards to Alan. And that's where we can show uh, good studio photography of the objects and we can interpret them and we can describe them. And we can go into a lot of detail on our collections online. It's a really good program. It's the KMU, it's an Australian database program. So that enables us to make connections with other uh, collections and other digital uh, databases. Uh, it's a really good system. It even pulls off newspaper articles from our people's past website over the National Library. So it's, it can be quite a layered. Way to deliver information around the objects. So there's that. And of course, we exhibit them when possible. 
uh, we can lend them to other museums. Uh, that would be our key. That would be our key way to provide access. I do blogs. I like on doing blogs. blogs. <laughs> I'm big on social media, um, so I like doing Te Papa blogs because that's like the official Te Papa channel, but I also use a lot of material and examples on my own, Facebook and, and Twitter, because what I find is when I talk about them away from the Te Papa brand, people tend to engage and, and, give, and exchange more stories than if they were to see a post on Te Papa's Facebook or Te Papa's Twitter. Um, I, I don't know why that is, the psychology behind it, but I find that when I talk about the material as an individual, that I get more um, dialogue back from the community about it. So I'm really big on social media exchange um, and, and disseminating stories that way. Um, yeah, wherever I can plant a seed and somebody can appreciate what we've collected, that's always a good thing. Okay, that's the material. So the type of material that we've collected. Um, I have tended to collect things like t-shirts. T-shirts are, um, I was worried I was gonna be known as the t-shirt curator because of the number of t-shirt mm -hmm. acquisition proposals I was putting up to, um, for the museum to collect. But um, Māori protest and Māori political movements, usually you will see a t-shirt created. So they're an amazing record for where Māori were um, giving their allegiance. Um, and for some reason, my people are the only people I know who will wear political t-shirts, as li um, political party t-shirts as leisure wear. Mm -hmm. So I have never seen a Labour or national person walk around with a t-shirt in the weekend. But with Māori, they're wearing mana, mana party, Māori party, and these are two major Māori political parties here in um, Aotearoa. So in terms of political placards, T-shirts are a really good, um, kind of enormous go-to for Māori. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the collections at Papa Pacific Māori uh, history all collect T-shirts with um, important messaging. We find it's a really um, easy and powerful way to collect social movements. Mm. Uh, people respond to them really well. We often show them on tours, or we've actually displayed them as well, and they've been really well received. Mm. So it's a simple device, familiar, very familiar material culture. We also collect, of course, all the other um, classic objects you'll see out in the street, in particular, banners, banners, posters, stickers, badges. Nothing is too small or humble. Is there a question there? No, I just. So you can see the people. Thank you. And can you hear us well enough? Yes, thank you. Right. Um, but yeah, we, we tend to collect a lot of ephemera papers, um, anything that's shared around at a protest, something that shows what the people want the spectator to understand and to know. So we were we were talking about the, uh, a protest march and what that is as a process. And the whole thing is about you're, you're carrying your message so that the people who are spectating and the people who you eventually end up on the doorstep, and then in this case, a lot of the time, we have protest marches that go through cities and end up on the streets of parliament, on the steps of parliament. But it's about the spectator who's watching your protest, understanding your message and trying to influence them. Do you want short, sharp, pithy protest slogans and badges that you can hand out and stickers, flags, so those are kinds of material that we tend to go after. Um, there, there are collection, dif um, collection management difficulties with some of these things because they're not made to last forever. They're, they're not like uh, protest. You don't see protest banners made out of wood. Well, actually you do in my case, but um, you know you don't see the flags and stuff that are made to last for a long time. So for our conservation team, they are constantly being challenged by the kinds of stuff that protest collecting brings into the museum. We also collect digital images of protests, uh, either protest objects, so uh, maybe di digital posters that didn't, didn't have a material form. So we'll collect the digital file and try and get the best file we can from the creator. Mm -hmm. uh, digital photographs of placards that we're acquiring. So for example, we are in the process of collecting from the Women's March on Washington that was held in Wellington recently. So we're collecting both placards and digital images 
of those placards mm. at the march. Mm. So trying to get two hits in one. Yeah. A big thing that um, we we haven't grappled with yet is collecting what our colleagues call the born digital material. So protests that are online and stay online, mm. petitions, um, forums, all those kinds of things. So it's really that's something that we haven't kind of got our head around yet as to how to collect that. Our colleagues down the road at National Library have, um, I think they're starting to collect a lot of that type of material and they're much more advanced in terms of collecting the board digital stuff. But if we're to look at the future of protest, you're going to see an increasing amount of protest material that is born digital material. So it won't have a material presence. Yep. So if you wanted to pursue that kind of collecting the National Library staff here, uh, would be the best people to speak to. They're, they're definitely ahead on that game. Mm -hmm. I think Twitter protests and hashtag protests and, those, and the like. Oh, okay. Next one. Is this okay? Are you still there? Um, that big group seems to have dropped off. Yeah. But, uh, oh, okay. Hang on. Hang on. Sorry, thank you. So if I turn around, so it's kind of now awkward squat thing. Um, this is really good. Now, I was very interested with you collecting the Women's March um, in Wellington because I noticed that a couple of days after the Women's March in Denver, the Denver Public Library is collecting a whole lot of hats and placards and other material. And the Fuller Craft Museum in Massachusetts, they're collecting as many hats as they can possibly get because for them it's the craft objects as protest that's important to them. So it's really interesting to hear that you're collecting from the march in. Um, Wellington as well. No, this is great, um, but we've probably got to get a bit more enthusiastic body language to cheer you on. Uh, that's all right. You're very fantastic. I know you're intimidated. Um, you were also collecting pussy hats too. And so we're picking from all the, you know, right across New Zealand, the women's marches, not just the Wellington one. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we try and collect protests that are nationally significant. Mm -hmm. So a lot of smaller local protests uh, we won't collect. We'll leave that to local institutions. We try and look at issues that are um, of a national concern. Yeah. I, 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 as much as we do have a national mandate for Māori protests, um, because I don't see the regional museums giving much coverage to collecting that material, I tend to throw my net wider than um, yeah. just looking for nationally significant um, protests because um, Māori protests tend to happen very regionally, very locally, but are, are, are not collected very much. Um, so, I'm, yeah, it's 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 hard, like, real revitalisation, environmental protests, a lot of those happen in very small pockets of the country for Māori. Um, so my thing is just trying to collect as much Māori protest expression as possible, as well as the notion, as well as the national narratives, the um, national protest narratives. So I'm a little bit more um, hard out trying to collect that material. A lot of organisations in New Zealand do not collect protest material. So I should sort of go back on what I said earlier. We are picking up the tab in some ways for mm -hmm. uh, a lot of New Zealand museums, mm -hmm. but I think there is a growing interest. But I suspect that we're probably at the forefront of collecting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so have what is it? Are there strategies to consider when collecting material which, while legal, is in conflict with council organisational policy? Well, we have so many checks and balances here at Papa and our acquisition processes mm -hmm. goes through at least two committees, two different levels of, of approvals that um, we haven't we haven't been in conflict with public policies as yet, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's such a big team of people working on these proposals. Mm -hmm. Curating is you are a personal advocate for stuff. So a lot of your own personal or political allegiance determines where you're probably going to place your attention. So um, I tend to go for stuff that is around Māori sovereignty. Um, signal boosting Māori protest. But on the other hand, um, I haven't gone out to collect stuff that's anti Māori, um, stuff that's from white supremacists, because we do have some, pro we've had some protests uh, from those groups against Māori um, stance or Māori political determination, which is still a really important part of Māori protest. 
but I haven't gone out to collect that stuff just yet. It may be something that I'll do when I know it's when it's becoming glaringly obvious that it needs to be addressed. But at the moment, my my ambition is to look at Māori expressions of protest. So that there are those kinds of things that are um, a, a curator has to grapple with. Sorry. Is there a question? We, we often collect after there's been law reform. So, uh, for example, homosexual law reform was in 1986, but Te didn't collect anything until the mid 90s. So it, it was collected in hindsight. So it's 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 as if the it's a very um what's what am I trying to say? It felt like a very clear path of collecting because the laws of the nation changed. We could we felt we had the total mandate to go and collect that homosexual law protest material. Uh, so it's often happened that way. We've often collected after there's been major societal and legal change. Uh, um, just last year, I collected a T-shirt that was um, created by a member of the Black Power. So Black Power is a, a um, primarily Maori gang, started as a motorcycle gang, but is now uh, thanks for going for the last 45 years. But Black Power is very much on the fringe of society, as you would imagine with a lot of these motorcycle gangs. But around about 10 years ago, um, a city called Bangui decided to introduce legislation that would ban gang patches from within their city limits. And a member of the Black Power created a T-shirt and protested that. Uh, and it was offered to me when I did a, a lecture about how I thought it was important to collect gang culture as well as what would be considered maybe mainstream Maori culture. Because in the future, um, the only source of stuff to talk about the gangs would be institutions that represent the police and the courts. So you'd be getting very much a perspective that comes from the state. Um, so when I had that lecture, a member of Black Power offered this t-shirt to me, and that was fine, I thought it was great. It's a protest action by a, um, a Māori gang. It was a form of um, like their act of resistance against this legislative change. But it did cause it did cause some consternation within my team in terms of putting that t-shirt physically into the collection where all of our Māori collection is held. The idea that this illegal illicit element was going to be placed next to very treasured and very revered what we call tāma or Māori treasure. So um, that's been something to na navigate and negotiate with my own team. Uh, there was a point when I was contemplating physically putting it into Steph's collection, into the history collection, so that the Māori team wasn't um, too upset. But as it stands, it's, yeah, I actually don't even know if it's been put into the Māori collection, but it's still in our secure or waiting for the collection managers to make a call. But it, it's that human element that you have to take into account that our staff were also starting to get very, um, anxious at where the curators were starting, like a curator like me was starting to collect. So for me, there's just, it's sometimes a matter of, no, uh, it's not a matter of no, just possibly not yet. Yeah, so Phil and I do work in two different teams, so we do have different, um, like different ways of working. So when I came on board to Tupper, I've been slowly building on what was here, and I think Phil has really spearheaded a whole new area of collecting. So we have had some different experiences yeah. in the same organisation. I've been shaking some beehives. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question. Oh, has there been public appeals for this material in the media, etc.? So the Women's March uh, project that I'm working on at the moment, we can put out an appeal through Facebook. And I think that might be the first time we've done that for for a widespread appeal and it's like, you know, it's a couple of days after the march in January and we said, please, you know, consider to cover and offer us your placards and your pussy hats. And we got about maybe about 30 responses and we sifted through them very quickly and we're down to, uh, we're going to collect about a dozen objects and get them plus digital images. Mm. But we've been constantly meeting and refining. So my a big part of my job has been managing the relationships and the expectations because it is a bit risky to going out there with the broad call for material because you 
we got a lot of very excited emails back and I didn't want to disappoint anybody. But um, I've managed to, I feel, come up with the right tone and in dealing with people, being really respectful and really positive. Mm -hmm. and, and I think so far it's working out fine. Mm -hmm. I haven't done any formal approaches except for that blog that I think Ellen came across where I was asking the public what protests they thought we should cover in the book. Um, but I do go through my own, and I'll, this is addressing the next question around um, if there are no formal appeals for material, have individuals or networks been approached? I go that way, yes. yes. So um, I, rather than throwing out a net, I might actually go and approach a family. Uh, just yesterday, I we emailed um, a protest group called Soul, who are based up in Auckland, and have been protesting about the sale of um, ancestral land up in the Auckland area. So we're really keen to profile that protest. So it's a matter of finding who's the right person. Luckily, it's a good friend of mine, and then sending her an overly too formal letter, which probably would have made her laugh. Um, asking for permission to work with them to determine what kind of material to publish should collect. So I prefer for um, the group who we're collecting from to help define the material that should come into the cover. Yeah. Um, I think it's a way of giving over a sense of autonomy um, to the group that you're collecting from, but also making sure that the material that you're getting has some integrity in terms of it really representing what that group wanted to convey to the world. So um, I prefer to work with the protesters yeah. Yeah, this way after the fact. Yeah, I, I generally speaking, I'd be the same. So the Women's March one is a bit of a bit of an experiment for us. Mm -hmm. And it's risky in terms of being so close to the event. We haven't had much hindsight. But we felt that the global nature of it and the fact that there were just millions of people marching in, on all continents of the, of the globe, we felt that it was a very zeitgeist moment that needed to be collected. Yeah. And we have noticed that many institutions around the world are collecting as well. Yeah. But generally speaking, we would wait a bit and get some hindsight. Okay. Is this all right for everybody? Thumbs up? Oh, good, good. Um, so how do we keep track of protests? We don't have a formal notification process for Te Papa. Um, a lot of the time, if we are going to protest, it's normally through our own networks. So um, I'm usually aware of kind of Māori protests that are happening, usually being told through um, word, of, um, word of mouth or through my social media, and I'll um, I'll try and keep track of it and try and participate as an observer or as a participant. So that's more than how I do it. And I'm not actually, even what I would call it, an activist. I hardly ever go. <laughs> but um, I'm keenly interested and I'm always uh, reading and watching and observing and talking to people. I call myself an observer, a, a passionate observer. So basically, we're looking for trends, we're looking for a sustained issues, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, enduring movements, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for passions across time, uh, who I and I see really interesting sort of cycles of time that might last over 100 years of issues mm -hmm. that keep coming around and around again, mm -hmm. and the material culture itself will get recycled over time, the images, the slogans, I mean there's just really interesting stuff, so you just start looking into it, you see some really interesting connections. Mm. Both intellectually and aesthetically, and, mm. and the relationships between the movements themselves and the activists in New Zealand and overseas, of course, the, mm. the influence of international movements. Mm. So, I guess it's just trying to keep a keen eye, a keen outlook. Yeah, trying to keep a, um, an eye on when protest actions start to change. So, a lot of the time you see protest actions in New Zealand, you'll have the march through the city centre, you'll have petitions. You'll have um, tables, information tables set up. So those kinds of things seem to be, be very conventional. What I'm really interested in is not just collecting that, but seeing those movements begin to change and morph and something else happening. So the board digital protests are something that's really fascinating to me because it's a different style of protest that we might not have seen in the past. So it, it, in terms of looking at protest as a process, 
the board digital material for me shows a new footstep in, in another direction. So that's what you have to also be aware of, not the protest with the kaupapa or the subject of protest, but the process of protest as well. Yeah. Uh, copyright issues, digitization and publishing. As Steph has been saying, we've got a really good um, acquisition system where copyright is um, normally handled at point of acquisition. Um, we, we split up our, we have a different process here, a system called manataonga. It's a philosophy of, um, which means that the object, uh, the people who are attached to the object and their beliefs and their communities are actually just as important as the object. So when you bring in an object, you are bringing in those people with you. So they become part of our collection management process. So uh, a nominated family member or a nominated representative becomes that point of contact for us whenever we are either researching the object or it's a request comes in to publish it or to, res uh, to exhibit it. We'll work with that family member or that, that protester or that individual so they help shape what the museum does. But in terms of copyright, we've got a really wonderful woman called Victoria Leachman who is on top of everything. So we try and get copyright of the object when we buy it or when we acquire it legally. It just makes things much, much easier down the line because without copyright, we're not allowed to put it on our collections online database. Yes, yeah, so if you Googled our collections online database and put, wrote protest, a lot of them wouldn't have any images attached, but you'd be able to see the written information, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't be able to see the image unless we clear copyright. Um, what we do, uh, we, we have a deed of gift for any donated material, and the deed of gift incorporates the copyright license. Mm -hmm. So it's all one piece of paperwork when we acquire the object. Mm -hmm. It should just be the one time we get to get that clearance. Mm -hmm. And then, um, as Pua was saying, we always work with people and donors and activists when we are going to present material in exhibitions. We usually uh, collaborate, if not co co curate. Mm -hmm. So they, they have some, uh, they can exercise um, control over some of the labels. So we run drafts, the label drafts past them, or public um, manuscript drafts past them. So that the way that we're representing that object is in line with what they want. So it's going back to the idea of the spectacle that, that they, they have some um, autonomy over what that original protest movement or, or placard was saying to the public. And that continues on through into our when we're displaying it. Privacy. Uh, yeah, there's a question here about privacy issues in relationship to the material collected. Um, we can keep people's names anonymous. For example, we collected a really fantastic handmade placard recently for a TPPA protest. The placard was made by a civil servant and he didn't want to breach his code of conduct. He was worried about it. So his name is anonymous. So it simply says gift of an anonymous donor 2016 with our credit line. I mean, his, his information is very deep in our system, but it can never be made public. Yeah. So we have the capacity to do that to honor those wishes. Now we have the same thing with the, a Destiny Church t-shirt that was handed in and donated, but the original owner did not want to be um, named with that t-shirt. So it actually came by a third party. The third party was named, but the original donor, um, I didn't get his name. Yeah. It happens quite a bit third party when we get third party people. Okay. Ooh. What would be the protection for staff if protests were particularly violent? It's an interesting question because we, we we don't do a lot of field collecting, but um in the, the field collecting that we have done, I'm not sure about who I, but it's been safe. So um We've got a code of conduct. You're yeah. not allowed to get up to mischief. You're not allowed to bring a museum into disrepute. So it's quite liberal. We're allowed to go out and, and do these kinds of protests. But um, I think the museum would frown if they saw that you were the one carrying the megaphone and the banner right up the front. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they don't mind you marching in it. Like we've had a couple of protests 
year, like the biggest protest action that's happened in the last 20 years was a march called the Kōshō and Seabed uh, peak wave, which for Māori was enormous. Mm -hmm. Our biggest mobilisation of Māori since the 70s. And um, before that protest march came to Wellington, a lot of a flurry of emails went around the museum saying that if you wish to participate in the protest, that's fine, but you must take annual leave. You must take annual leave and, um, you know, you abide by the code of conduct. So don't go out and wallop anybody. So it's, to my, it, it gives us a lot of freedom, but that code of conduct that we have to sign when we're appointed is, um, that's quite a big deal. Um, violent. It, we're lucky that a lot, of, a lot of the protests here in New Zealand don't tend to get very violent, um, but there have been some. I've never collected in a violent, um, a violent scenario at all, um, but we do have material that comes from stuff like the Springbok tours mm -hmm. of the um, early 80s, where that was incredibly violent, and we've got a lot of some of the batons and the helmets that were worn by protesters. So if there is violence, a lot of the time we're collecting after the fact. Yes. And protesters, former protesters and activists, will normally offer that up because they realise it was such an important historical moment, and they want want it to be remembered, but also know that the, the museum is really good at looking after stuff. So as they get older and they want to downsize, you tend to see this material get offered to the museum as a donation. So we're lucky we've we've been able to bypass violent scenarios. Yes, so far. And when I said earlier about seal collecting, we actually, uh, I don't know about Pearl but we actually don't stand in the middle of a march asking to take people's cards. <laughs> But if we see really compelling material culture, we might take somebody's name or we'll follow up with some, you know, the major organisations afterwards. Mm -hmm. We don't tend to take stuff on the spot. It feels like we would be intervening mm -hmm. in the process. We mm -hmm. tend to just observe and then follow up later. Mm -hmm. We feel it's more respectful. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. I think those are all the questions. So. Feel free to ask us some more if you want. I'm John from Manly in Sydney. Um, can I ask you if um, New Zealand Security Agency was to come asking to see part of your collection, do you have protocols and ways to deal with that? Well, we provide access to anybody who asks. Mm. We're very open, actually. We, we often show um, researchers and visitors into our collections. Mm. But they won't be able, so for instance, we talked about that anonymous donor, they, they can't come into our, um, if we've got it as a collection record, it can't be touched. However, we do have a Public Records Act in New Zealand that if you create material, that, uh, documents that are like office documents, and you name that person in that, uh, like if, if it's in an email or something, that becomes accessible. People can give an official information um, request, so but they can't do it for a collection record for some reason. But for public documentation, emails, public corres um, correspondence, that's they can come in after that. So we tend to keep the donor information if they're anonymous, keep it to our database. Yeah, they they can't be touched. So far, and we, we I don't know, I can't find an example where we're being tested. No, no, not yet. But we get constant OIAs, constant official information requests, um, but mostly from people who want to um, see how much their papa has been spending on flights and restaurants and all that kind of thing. <laughs> Hello there, uh, Jeff Potter from uh, Central Coast Libraries. Um, can you can each of you nominate the protest items that you have collected that have most impacted on you personally? Good question. Uh, uh, one that, that I've been really happy with has been um, a Destiny Church, going back to the church, Destiny Church, Enough is Enough t shirt. Um, so, when Destiny Church marched against the legalization of prostitution and the Civil Unions Act, 
Um, they all wore these black t-shirts with red writing and some white writing saying enough is enough and marched through town all dressed in black pants and black shirts. I actually marched against them with all of the Rainbow Squad, so with all of the LGBT um, IT um, activists who had gone out in response to the Destiny Church march, so I was on the other side. But when I saw that t-shirt, I mean, for our takatapu whanau, so I'm straight, so I, 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 for me it was like, um, uh, it didn't have the same aggression that I knew that my um, LGBT um, comrades were feeling because I knew it was directed at them. Uh, but when I collected it around about 10 years later, Steph and I, Steph and I did a, an exhibition called Uniformity, so I wanted that in there to talk about a protest t-shirt. But it was a protest t-shirt from what I thought was the other side. It was a... it. it, it caused some consternation because of the ultra conservative nature of Destiny Church and there was a sense that we were giving, we were lending credibility to the church by the National Museum collecting it. But I keep thinking about a curator 50 years in the future who was there to talk about the LGBT Fano and their struggles and this t-shirt could be used to talk about the aggression directed towards them. They could use it as an icon for looking at um, the kind of anti-gay movements that were happening in New Zealand. So that to me was the reason I wanted to collect it, not to support destiny, but to make sure that we had something that could be used in that debate. But I know when we put it into our exhibition uniformity, our writer who was, who was gay, he found it really hard. He found it um, really difficult to write about it and to talk about it. And it was um, because of he, he had actually been harassed that day. So that to me is, you have to think about what your responsibility is and the, the communities that you're going to affect with your collecting decisions. Uh, but it was great because last year that t-shirt, or this year that t-shirt was used to talk about, um, what was it, that lovely kid with that block? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's it, what's it really? Uh, oh, she wrote. She wrote about it and used it in that, exactly that kind of function to talk about the um, the the aggression that's given towards the gay and lesbian queer communities. Yeah, and, and one of my um, proudest objects is a an object that survived over five years of protest against apartheid sport being played in New Zealand. So it was a big banner, featured a portrait of Steve Biko, and it, it was carried at marches in 1981 against the Springbok Tour here in New Zealand, the Springbok Rugby Tour. And then in 1985, when the All Blacks were trying to go to South Africa to play there, so the banner came out twice. And its second outing, it got smashed to bits by um, uh, people who wanted the tour to go ahead and eggs thrown at it. <laughs> it got repaired and then um, offered to to Papa, and I was really excited by that. It, so it's been broken, it's survived, it's been fixed, it's still got egg stains on it, and I really love that. I think it's a really great material object, which it, the violence is still embedded in it, and I think it's really powerful. It's a great question, thank you. I have one, can you hear me? What about the, the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior and the anti-nuclear protest? Did you collect anything on those? Yeah, we've actually got a lot of material. So a lot of material came in in the 90s when they were developing Tupapa as a concept. Tupapa opened in 1998. So for about five years before that, they did a lot of what was called, I guess, social history collecting. And they collected lots of um, t-shirts and badges. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived, I decided that I would build on that collection. And partly because we were doing a theme on it in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. But I got to know some amazing activists um, in Christchurch and Auckland um, and in Wellington. Mm -hmm. And uh, word got out. And I just slowly built up a collection, uh, ban big large-scale banners, um, Maybe, probably maybe the typical sorts of objects, banners, posters, badges, t-shirts, 
And I also uh, found out where other kitchens were held. So, for example, the Police Museum here in Wellington has an amazing collection of around the Rainbow Warrior. They've got all the evidence, they've got all the damaged ship parts and the objects that the French <laughs> left behind. <laughs> <laughs> so, we always try and keep tabs on who's got what to make sure that our collections are complementary, particularly around such major moments as holding the Rainbow mm -hmm. Warrior. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fabulous, and I think it's given us all a lot to think about. Um, could everyone join with me in thanking Stephanie and Floyd? <laughs>